I'm on stage doing what I'm doing as a you know uh, young confident Arab Muslim male uh, and rapping in this language that they understand that they can relate to. Once they discover that you're like them in the pursuit of, of happiness, I think they, they, they take you in. She experiences our two cultures with a, a pure, fresh, open mind. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by Navigating cultures in America's polyglot society requires both skill and artistry. Hip-hop artist Omar Effendum, cafe owner Frederic Boudwani, and young Alia Suwaya are bridge builders. They live their lives embracing their Arab and American sides and give anyone who meets them a lesson in cultural competence. Omar Effendum is an artist, activist, educator, poet, and a bridge between his Arab roots and his American upbringing. He's found an audience of young Americans and young Arabs eager to figure out the forces that connect us. One man show over here. I hear that. I'm with you. Yes, sir. Do it all. I'm a walk-in, talking record label. Make some noise for Omar Fender! Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Omar Fenderman. I'd like to welcome you to a lovely little place I call Syriana Americana. See, this is a nation state of mind where everything is connected and everybody is welcome. Would you like to join me? Give you a little Arabic one-on-one -on -one right here, see? I don't say bro, I say hello. I mix my garlic and mayo. You ask me where, I say hey yo. Then ask me why, I say le yo. See, my business is shirley. Blood boiling bigly. Don't you stop. You know, when I'm on tour, I have the opportunity to perform in you know, a variety of settings, and that's something I really appreciate. No cash for your own cab? Well, you better isherly. Put a kind of a special importance on performing at college uh, campuses and universities because that's kind of where I first got uh, not just into hip hop, but also first got politicized and really understood, you know how important um, you know, identity politics were, especially in the United States. And I really enjoy speaking to classes and having you know, the opportunity to kind of tell my story, uh, create an intimate space that you know, students are comfortable kind of uh, sharing their stories in as well. For me, at the end of the day, what I try to do with my work is kind of reflect you know, the ideals that the community that raised me in kind of you know, have been instilled in me. And, uh, and the notion of humanity, letting people kind of see the humanity in one another, regardless of where we're from, what our ethnicity or race or religion or sexual orientation or any of that is. I think you know, art at its best can do that, can remind us of that, that you know, human connection that we have with each other and with each other's experiences. Um, because what happened you know, after 9-11, I felt like, was that we were so quick to tell people what we weren't. You know, I'm not a terrorist, I'm not an extremist, I'm not this, I'm not that. Uh, and not take the time to tell them what we really are, you know. Younger Americans are very interested in what's happening uh, in a genuine way, you know. And, um, and that's resulted in them being more interested in my music. For years now, you can break the beat down to a little bit more. And one of the saddest things about that is that lives, human lives, just become numbers. See? We've grown numb to imagery of death and demise. Blind as St. Paul till he saw a Syrian sky miles away. Wars praying on the teariest eyes. A deaf ears to lay here in a cry. Why is it even worth asking anymore? Guilt is but a swinging door. Crooked men on either side cushioning each other's fall. Orphans hiding from a devil with dark wings. 
are writers with a conscience fill it, pluck at our hard strings. But very seldom do we bother to speak. Led to believe we're rendered powerless by fatherless creeps. Bastardized politickers while our daughters beseech us to let them flee these borders in peace. I wonder if these sad scenarios will still remain as commonplace when I'm a father. Want to face a lot without regrets. Could have tried harder. Quranic verses. We can all live or die by Yale Teni Kuntu Turaba. Now, Yale Teni Kuntu Turaba basically means I wish I was dust. And it's believed that on that day, when our souls are resurrected, and if we're asked, if we feel like we've done enough, those who don't, that's what they say. I've been doing this for years and years, but uh, the interest has really, really spiked um, uh, as these events have started to unfold in the Middle East. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I think that you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to be in the position that I'm in, to be able to speak to these issues. Who live within this conspicuous state? Sore thumbs, short crumbs can cure hunger. But what are the post-traumatic stress a three-year-old will undergo in Baghdad? Make some noise for yourselves for coming out and supporting real hip-hop music and spoken word art with a message. Thank you. Peace, 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 peace be upon you. This is Real Talk only on One Legacy Radio. I am Sammy Mutton, of course. I'm joined my man, Imam, Suhaib Webb, Rehan Jalali, Omar Fendom, Action Pack Show. I met Sammy Mutton a couple years ago in Southern California, and we kind of hit it off right away. And it's great to be able to see eye to eye with somebody. I mean, I'll find instances where you know, I'll be in a studio, we'll have friends visiting, people, you know, watch me do a take. They'll think it sounded great, but he'll know that it wasn't the take that I wanted. Whenever you're ready. Let's do this. Yo. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Too long, the Middle East and freedom song was considered improbable or not even optional. The Arab youth were too irresponsible, religion an obstacle. But it was inevitable that the conscious folk who knew what was possible, conditions were optimal. The domino effect that y'all neglected was unstoppable. The song is called Domino Effect, and um, it essentially is just talking about what's happening in the Middle East right now with respect to the uprisings and uh, and the ripple effect that's taking place, you know, from one nation to another. It's important to shed light on this, uh, especially for people here in the United States who don't necessarily think about it, uh, and as often as I do, but who. Uh, who are really affected by it, you know, whether whether they, they like to believe it or not. You know, we live in that kind of world today. It's a shrinking globe. The United States' foreign policy has had a huge, huge effect on the region. And, um, you know, this is this is all playing out right now, you know, and this is the results of that, so. And I can't tell you what it means to me when hearing millions of my people chant for peace and freedom, so rebel and overwhelm and wish my father lived to see the vote. And in some ways, the medium is the message too, in the sense that I'm I'm on stage doing what I'm doing as a you know uh, young, confident Arab Muslim male, uh, and rapping in this language that they understand that they can relate to, in this art form that they can relate to, and that in itself is the, is a message. So it is it, you know I don't I don't take lightly the position that I'm in you know, and um, and as the years have gone by, I've kind of really tried to push myself to craft lyrics that that uh, that address that and and really get at the core of what I'm trying to do, which is be that bridge, you know, uh, for my own sanity. Because I live in the U.S. and I am Arab and I am Muslim and I'm proud of all those things, you know, so. With an agreement that the lenders cut them off at the knees and get to freeze their bank accounts and hold amounts for what they stole amounts to trees. And all these clowns are stepping down and skipping yeah. the town. You might not expect to find an Algerian cafe in Iowa, but then you probably don't know El Cater, Iowa is named for an Algerian war hero. Serendipity brought Frederic Boudouani and Brian Bruding to the small town. Their mission? To give the town a taste of its namesake's culture, from the Middle East to the Middle West.
My name is uh, Frederic Fethi Boudouani. Uh, I'm the co-owner of Shara's Algerian American restaurant. Uh, you're here in Al Qaeda, Iowa, a town that's named after uh, Emir Abdul Qadir, sort of uh, the George Washington of Algeria for those who are not familiar with, uh, with him. This is uh, our little endeavor in uh, Al Qaeda, Iowa, a town of uh, a little over 1,200 people. Welcome to Shiraz, uh, short for Shahrazad from Arabian Nights, but it's also my sister's name. Thank you guys for coming. Yep. Have a great day. Have a great day. You Thanks. Too. This room is actually signifi very significant to this community. Um, as, small, as small of a community as Al Qaeda is, uh, it has nine spots that are on the National Registry of Historical Places. Um, when the courthouse across the river here was being built, this room served as a courtroom for about three years. So it's kind of a, a special room. We can go outside if we'd like to. We were not strangers to Iowa. My partner, Brian, is a, a native Iowan. Both of us went to school and lived in Boston. So we were familiar with the state. We would come and uh, visit his family at least a couple of times a year. Um, then September 11th happened. So in my way of trying to uh, make sense of that horrific event, I decided to research the history of Islam in the United States. And to, uh, to my great surprise, uh, that led me to the Mother Mosque in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, my dad, uh, being of Algerian descent, um, it was, it was uh, quite a special moment for me, so we, uh, we made the drive and uh, we, came, we went to City Hall and uh, they literally um, picked up the phone and called this gentleman that was uh, an ex-mayor and he was there within a minute. It encouraged them that maybe if they were looking for a place to change what they did and all that you know, Al-Qaeda would be the ideal spot. So it just all worked out. The restaurant became available. Yeah. Ed, my husband, uh, his name was Ed Olson, and uh, he has worn a lot of different hats in Al-Qaeda, uh, but he was mayor for uh, eight years. I think, I think he had better, uh, he, had, uh, he had it all planned out. I, remember, <laughs> I would never for, forget this. Uh, so we go back from our visit to Al-Qaeda, and like a couple of weeks later, the Clayton County Register, the, the town newspaper, started showing up in our mailbox. <laughs> and that was his uh, <laughs> little way of throwing hints at us and uh, keep us interested in what was going on. We just developed this very strong relationship. It's just like having, never having a son. I have a son now. Uh, he, um, he's, he, you know, if I, I need anything, he's, he will help me. It was fascinating to me that there is this guy that is from a Norwegian background. Uh, he was he was head in this community, and he he saw something in this connection and wanted to nurture it and uh, develop it. And had it not been for him and for her and what they've started, I would have never been here. So this is where the magic happens. This is my partner Brian. It's, a, it's kind of a smaller space, but uh, it's, it still amazes me the amount of things that we can get out of here, so. In the Midwest are live and let live people. You show up, you're different, and uh, you're cooking this food that they're not used to. Once they discover that you're like them in the pursuit of, of happiness, I think they they, they take you in as, uh, as one of their own, and yeah. they think, yeah, you're all right. We'll, uh, we'll take you in, so. They make a hot sauce. It's just great. Called the har harissa. That's just out of this world. But uh, very rare sometimes if you find a place with such good food, uh, good beer, uh, a little bit of culture. Uh, you don't usually find that. Uh, so that makes it worthwhile to kind of stop here every week. But to find a place like this is just like a jewel, you know, so because it's hard to find good food out in the middle of nowhere, and these guys have it, so. Yes, I'm ordering the um, portobello mushroom um, sandwich, because I've had that before and I loved it. Yeah, this is Main Street al <laughs> the big metropolis that it is. How are you guys? So we acquired the space and uh, restored it. 
Uh, tonight we're using the space for uh, an art exhibit. <laughs> Mascara Park, um, dedicated to our sister city in Algeria, Mascara. In the early 90s, uh, there was a peace pole that was erected that reads, uh, may peace reign on earth, and it reads it in different languages, including Arabic. This is my parents, my dad and mom. And this is Brian's parents. So it was a community effort to, uh, to raise money to, to, uh, to restore the park. This was erected in the, uh, to the memory of Ed Olson. He is uh, sort of the, uh, the founder of the Sister City organization, and he was a man with a vision and kind of kept it alive. They actually had exchanges and went to Algeria, and they had Algerians come back here. And we were treated like royalty. And uh, we, were, we were very important people over there when we were there. This is our livelihood, but uh, in, in, in my mind, it's, it's more than that. I, I truly consider it that it's sort of a tool for, a tool for bring, building bridges through, uh, uh, through, through one of the things that are the most uh, dear and important to people, food. Every marriage is a merging of cultures. Krista Bremer and Ismail Suwaya have learned to both negotiate and celebrate difference with each other and their kids. It requires constant attention on her parents' part, but 10-year-old Alia navigates her two cultural heritages effortlessly. I am a writer. For the last several years, I've written personal essays and memoir, and I am working on a memoir about my bicultural family. I'm exploring the differences between my own upbringing as a middle-class American uh, from an atheist family, and I'm married to a, a Libyan-born Muslim who was raised by illiterate parents in, in a very poor environment. I was born in a coastal town that's situated west of Tripoli, the capital of Libya. I came to the U.S. to get a Ph.D., so I had a scholarship from the university in Tripoli. By the time when I finished, Libya was under sanctions, and Gaddafi's signature was really not only just internal, but also external, so that made it difficult. And it made the decision for me to stay easy. Uh, yeah. yeah. Really good. Well, she, we left Libya with them, right? Mm -hmm. the same we, we just brought a bunch of them. They're really delicious. The, the things I really miss for my kids from that culture is really community. It's, it's just a sense of, like, uh, regardless of your circumstances, there are people around you all the time. Oh, Alia, can I borrow a pick? Because I accidentally left mine at home. Yeah, there should be one somewhere in that box. Mm, I'm going to try to use a... No, I think... Oh, I have a pick, <laughs> like, somewhere. <laughs> I swear I do. Hold on. We're doing a thing called Crafts for Libya, and we're raising money um, for uh, Libya. And the original Crafts for Libya was on my blog, and I posted that I was selling um, stuff like scrunchies, um, earrings, uh, flower bobby pins, like little bobby pins with knitted flowers on them. I'm just gonna spread these out. Wait, what's this one supposed to be? A leaf. I did that over the summer and the end of the school year. And um, now we're doing kind of a second, a second like part of it. Um, our school, Smith Middle School, they do this um, big fair every year called Global Connections. And like, it's like really big, like to give you an idea of it, last year they had hot air balloons and normally about a thousand people come. And, um, but they we're doing this thing called Global Marketplace this year where people can have stands to raise money for charity. So we're gonna have a stand for Crafts for Libya. And so right now I'm making 
a leg warmer, and I think Kara's making a scarf. Yeah. The first crafts for Libya, uh, I just thought, I, I felt like I wanted to raise money and for Libya since like, you know, my dad was like really anxious and like I, I had heard what was going on. And so I started that like around the time that um, the revolution started, like a couple months afterwards. The money is actually going to, um, it's gonna go to orphaned children in Libya whose parents like died fighting. And so, yeah. It's important to both of us to raise our children to choose uh, what they appreciate the most from our, you know, our, our dramatically different backgrounds and our different cultures. Ready. And um, I think that we both recognize that each of our cultures has something really valuable to offer them. And there are also very real limitations from each of our backgrounds that we would like to, um, you know, spare our children. So I think that every step of the way we try to, you know, question our own assumptions and uh, our own prejudice. And it's a, an ongoing process because we continue to, at least speaking for myself, I would say, I continue to uncover prejudice that I didn't realize I had. New Moon Magazine is a magazine for girls, by girls, and it's really down to earth, um, so I really like it. Uh, this article is about um, comparing the American version of beauty and the Libyan version of beauty. I walked out of the Tripoli airport to shouts of joy. Aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and even strangers rushed toward me. Before I knew it, I found myself encased in folds of beautiful, earth-toned, intricately designed, handmade cloth, the smell of rose water and incense mingling in my nose. My shoulders were wet with my family's tears of happiness. My mother is American, but my father is from Libya, where the concept of beauty couldn't be more different than the hot supermodels and trendy American brands. In Libya, with the exception of the headscarf, the dominant colors are earth tones, white, tan, black, brown, and cream. Most women in Libya wear head coverings called hijabs. There are hundreds of ways to wear them with different pins, knots, and folds. In the marketplace, there are beautiful silk pashmina, silk pashmina cotton, and polyester scarves in every color and pattern you can imagine. Western-style clothing such as mini skirts and skinny jeans are rarely seen. Women here wear modest outfits, baggy cotton pants and loose shirts, and long cloth dresses. I like wearing it uh, seasonally, like when it's uh, cold out, I like wearing because it it's warm. I think what I learned from her is that, you know, she's not burdened by any negative associations with either of our cultures. And so she um, experiences our two cultures with a, a pure, fresh, open mind. When she decided that she wanted to wear a headscarf to school, it just never occurred to her that anyone could judge her negatively for wearing this beautiful piece of cloth. She also was not concerned at all by the fact that she was the only one who dressed that way. And that, that's probably more her personality than anything, but I admire that a great deal. And, and I admire her ability to integrate these different influences without seeing them as opposed to one another. My visit to Libya will remain deeply etched in my mind for as long as I live. I love wearing the headscarf and showing my uniqueness as an Arab American. My experience showed me that I definitely favor the Libyan idea of beauty to the American one and always will because my style is modest and comfortable. I think my marriage to Krista actually made me a better Muslim and a better human being in general. And our differences really bond us rather than divide us. And so she really, um, she gave me more appreciation of the differences between our cultures, uh, having to navigate our own differences. She forced me to be more tolerant, more patient, um, better listener, uh, although that's something I still struggle with. I think that he always longed for and idealized a certain type of freedom that he uh, felt he could find in the West. That's true. And it's fascinating to me because I grew up with all of that freedom and sort of expansive, you know, um, sort of boundlessness. And, and I think I always longed for 
more of the structure. You know, I think we've both been seeking these things and we bring them into balance sometimes with one another. I am Netta Ulavi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American Stories. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 